Ja, det er bra. Yes. Ha det bra means goodbye, doesn't it? Yeah. Ok, nå er vi i en position hvor vi kan write opp vår full model. Vi har over tre constraint sets. Disse one og de to previous ones. But we have to formulate the objective, okay? But that's straightforward. So let's do it immediately. So let me take this out. Okay, full model. Now, as I said, we are looking at costs here and we want to find the allocation of our resources such that we minimize the total costs. This is the typical objective in logistics and we will see that in almost any model we look at. Even though there are some. Any rule has some exceptions, uh, this one as well. Now we can sum up here from t equals 1. And this is a constant I actually forgot to define. We need to have our time horizon in as a constant. That is the kind of number we decide on. In our example it was 6, wasn't it? It was 6 periods. It could be 12, it could be any number here. But uh, this is a constant that I forgot to put among the other constants, which should have been there. And then we have our hiring costs which are constructed like this, the cost per person hired times the number of persons hired in period T. So for each of our pairs, of course, we have to add these up together. So we see H times H1 plus CH times H2 and so on, which is written like this to save space. And then we fire people, CF times FT. And then there is some inventory which produces costs, and then there is this CK times PT, the total production cost. Then there might be some overtime, COOT, plus potentially some undertime. And finally, maybe we may have some subcontracting, and this is all our costs added together in each period over all periods. So that is the objective. Then we have some subject 2 here. We have already discussed these constraints or equations as this is in this case. So there's nothing wrong in the model to either use equalities or inequalities. That is okay. We can in fact construct an inequality by using uh, we can in fact construct an equality by using two inequalities, can't we? If we want x to be equal to 2, we can write this like this. So we are kind of in a situation where we can stick only to inequalities if we like. And that has actually a name in the theory, it's called an LP on so-called standard form. In that sense you only use less than or equal equalities. You can make this by multiplying by one, minus 1 to turn it around. You see, so you don't have to use equalities really. But there is, there's no problem in the software here to use it like this. Minus 1 plus the number hired minus the number fired. And of course, this equation is for all t in 1 up to our capital T, which is the time horizon here. So for the example, this would be 6. There are 6 periods there. We tend to use this sign instead of writing for all in mathematics. It's a simplification, if you don't know it already. Then we have our inventory balance equation. Same here, one for each time period. And then finally the production calculation if you like. for all t, and then of course all my variables must be positive here. So ht, ft, it, ot, 
ut, st, wt, and pt must all be positive variables. Now this is a full specified linear program of our aggregated production planning model. A few words on extensions here. We have already discussed that this is a very simplified model in the sense of the workforce. It could be different categories. Each category would typically have different productivity, but all categories cannot do the same job. So in such a modeling frame, we would have to kind of make an image of the production process much more refined. It could, for instance, be sequential problems that certain operations must be done before other operations. You see, and that is not the part here. Here we just push in new employees and we push out more product. It could be some kind of time frame here within the time period that certain operations must be done before others. If you want to build a house, of course, you have to lay the ground before you produce the roof and that kind of stuff. Okay, these kind of logical bindings must be then taken care of. And it will typically be different costs in hiring and firing and typically also different production costs because the salary differs between different categories. So it will be a quite a big enhancement in kind of moving this model into a model where you actually model also different categories of workers. It could be outside demands on which type of workers who must be present in producing certain products. That is a different way of extending it, looking at different products. Okay, this is a single product. Most companies have different products. And the different products may need different qualification categories of workers and so on. Okay, so all these could make this a much, much larger and different, uh, much more complex model. If you look at the model as it is, it could be relatively simple extensions related to simple facts like it could be that you cannot store an infinite amount as you have here. It could be constraints on how much you could put into storage. Then you would have something like, for instance, that i t should be smaller than or equal to some kind of numbers which says that in certain periods you're allowed to store so and so much and so and so and so. It could be constraints on how many to hire or how many to fire in different periods. Again, you can formulate it like this and add it to the model to make it behave differently. It could, of course, be other logical constraints, which are different in, in a given setting than in this kind of general simplified setting. So there's a lot of options here in uh, extending this model type into different types of models. OK. Any questions? Well, if you look at this model, it doesn't look like a kind of model we can input into our software, does it? Because it has this, we have to kind of have a system where we, we, we kind of put in W1 and H2 and so on. So we have to write it slightly differently in order to put it directly into the Lingo software. Fortunately, all, almost all of these uh, software packages has a certain device which are often referred to as a modeling language where you can kind of enter the model like this with these subscripts and that kind of stuff, okay? Which could be a variables in the model, so to speak. So you can kind of look at different situations, a six months period, a four week and so on, okay? So by just changing the data. Uh, we will not go into that, at least not yet. Maybe later on in the course I will see, okay? That for, because that is kind of another step. So in order to use our software to solve this type of example, which was kind of the main aim, we have to write out our example in a full specified version. I will do that now so you see how it works, okay? So the next step is to look back now on our example and try to use this model to solve that example to find the optimal plan. We have identified two plans which not necessarily are optimal, so let's try to do that. So then I will just take this one out and hopefully we can have it uh, in our heads. I think that should be okay. Okay. 
our example. It contained three cost elements. It had a hiring cost of 500. It had a firing cost of 1000. It had an inventory cost of 80. So in this example, we didn't kind of look at these overtime cost, undertime, idle cost, subcontracting, and that kind of stuff. So we kind of have to reduce our model no, to capture this reality. So this leads to, if you like, a reduced model. And the objective now will only contain Again, we can sum it now from 1 to 6, if we like. CH, our hiring cost, our firing cost, and our inventory cost. So all these other cost elements are, of course, not needed now. They are kind of not there, so we can just take them out. So all these variables should no, suddenly don't have a, a cost, or actually they have, a, in principle, an infinite cost. That's kind of what it means because we don't, we don't kind of look at them. So they, they, they are not uh, relevant. It may be you now that we have to adjust our constraints as well. As we have picked variables out of the objective, we typically pick out the same variables from the constraints. And that should be straightforward. The first set was the workforce set. And of course, the workforce from the previous period must be there. We must add over hires and we must subtract over fires but that's all here but that that is the same one as we had before isn't it there's no change here if i remember correctly so that doesn't change no it's as before but when we move to the inventory balance constraint of course we don't have to bother with with this subcontracting because it doesn't have a cost so it's not a part of the model so that can be taken out so it is in this example, it minus 1 plus pt minus dt. So this st is taken out. It's not a part of our example. And then finally, our production constraint, which looked like this. Indeed, this part is taken out, so we only stick back with this one. Pt equals k times nt times wt. And if you think back on the example, now we have these numbers. They are 500, 1000 and 80 respectively. That one is given, six periods. We have this one, it was 20, 16, a set of numbers we had, and we had this one, which was 0 point something. I don't remember it. Okay. So the question now is kind of how do we write out this fully specified in order to kind of be able to put it into lingo without using this magical, mysterical mod modeling language which I talked about. Okay, then we just have to do it, okay? It's, uh, it's not that difficult. Just let me take it out and let me write it out fully specified. My object objective would be 500 times h1 plus h2 plus blah 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 up to h6, wouldn't it? And I, of course, I have to specify all these variables in my model. I can't use the dots here. Okay, I must actually add three, four, five as well. But on the on the blackboard, I'm doing it to, to cons cons conserve some space. And then 1,000 times F1 plus F2 plus up to F6. And then I will have to add 80 times I1 plus I2 plus 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 up to I6, possibly. You will see about this I6 a little bit later, OK? It has certain demands on it. And then let's look at this constraint set 1, okay? It was wt equals to wt minus 1 plus ht minus ft. Of course, we have to represent 1 for each of the time periods now. So 
in the first period we will get w1 equals 2 w0 if I just write in the numbers here minus h1 uh, sorry yeah I, I wrote it quite a little bit differently here and, and that, that has a reason okay I, I prefer when I do put it into kind of have all the variables on the left hand side and have a zero on the right hand side so the original equation looks like this if I take everything here and put it on the left hand side and of course I end with the zero on the right hand side and I get wt minus wt minus 1 minus ht plus ft okay that should equal zero there's nothing wrong with writing it like this but I prefer that okay to, to keep all the variables on the left hand side and I can write it specifically on, because it's easy to kind of keep track on what's happening so then I will get w1 minus w0 w0 is a number here isn't it that is actually 300 so that should be 300 when we put it in and then we have to subtract h1 and add f1 and put that to 0 that is the first out of six, six equations under label 1 here and then we have to go to w2 minus minus w1 minus h2 plus f2 equal to 0 and we have to continue this all the way down to w6 minus w5 minus h6 plus f6 equals to zero so there will be six equations here each of them will have to be actually entered into the program Of course, you have to continue this stuff, don't you? Okay. Have you written it down? Not yet. Okay. Let's wait just a little moment. Okay, good. So as you probably know, you really don't have to write this down because it will be on the video in any case. Unless you feel that you learn by writing it, you, you don't have to, but uh, that's of course entirely up to you. These two looked like it equals i t minus 1 plus pt minus dt in this version. And of course, in the same manner, we have to write this out fully. Start by t equals 1, then move to t equals 2, and so on. So this becomes i1 equals i0 plus p1 minus d1. This i0 has a value, hasn't it? It was the number we had available on inventory before we started, and that was 500. So the first constraint, he should read like this, i1 minus p1 moved to the left hand side keeping that rule plus d1 and keeping zeros or constants on the right side should equal 500 agree that is one way of writing this first inventory balance constraint and the next one this is uh, number one one so to speak and then we get to one two no sorry two one two two Number two, then we put t equals to two, then we get from this one, sorry, let me do it. Then we, we kind of start with i2 equal to i1 plus p2 minus d2, okay? Putting t equals to two in this one. And doing the same, we can kind of rearrange, putting on the left hand side, then we get uh, uh -huh, 
Yeah, I have actually done it quite a little bit differently, I think. Yeah, there, there is some other numbers here, isn't it? This D1 is a number, isn't it? It's a, a constant in our optimization. So we can enter that number now for D1 if you like. And D1 was, how was it? It was 1280, I seem to recall. So instead we can finish this a little bit more, I think. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You see, if I enter 1280 on the left hand side here, and put it to the right hand side, I get a negative number here. I don't prefer to have that. So I move it back. So I take 1280 minus 500 and put on one side. Then I get a positive. I have to rearrange the sign here. You see? So I end up here in the first one with P1 minus I1 equals 780. And that is the first equation I would put into Lingo. Again, of course, you can actually put in both 500 and 1280 here if you like and write it as it is. There's no problem with it. That works just as well. But uh, I prefer to kind of keep the structure, having all the variables on the left-hand side, trying to avoid negative numbers on the right-hand side. And then along the same kind of reasoning, I can move on to 2, 2 and construct P2 minus i2 plus i1 by entering the d2 then in that equation I get uh, that should be equal to 640 and then number 3 let me write them out fully now p3 minus i3 plus i2 equals 900 of course you can recognize the more or less original demand numbers here. This, this one was kind of adjusted with these 500, so that is, is a change, just like the original demand profile, uh, or the, the, the adjusted one. And we get P4 minus I4 plus I3 equal to 1200. And we get P5 minus I5 plus I4 equal to 2000. In the final equation we, we, we then get P5 minus I6. But I6 was supposed to have a value, wasn't it? We should have 600 in inventory when we ended. So we can substitute I6 with 600 directly here. Of course we keep I5 here. And that should equal uh, 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 uh. 1400, I think. Yes, that was the original value. So we kind of re redo the original process now. So when we move that one over, we get the plus in front, so it ends up with. We can do that directly, can't we? We can take that one out and add the 600 to this one, which then will remain 2000. Isn't it? Yeah. So we kind of get a structure here in the first equation, we get two variables due to the fact that we had a given initial inventory, which we kind of entered and then had a consequence on the right hand side here. The two, three, four and five equations keep these three variables on the left hand side with the original demand numbers here. The final equation is, is also only two variables, production and the in inventory from the previous period. Is this clear? You have to write everything out. Of course, you can make your own decisions on how to form it, form, formulate it, how to write it, whether you want to follow my rule on keeping constants on the right-hand side and the other on the left. That's, of course, entirely up to you. But I find that perhaps most structured. And it's always a good reason to keep some structure here. Because if you make an error or if you want to change the data, then you must be able to see how to change them in the correct way. That's not obvious. That is the main problem with doing it like this, because if you have large models, of course, you have to write a lot. And the idea by this modeling language or 
generating type of language is to avoid that, to kind of keep the model the same and then have data kind of separated. So you can kind of just change the data without actually interfering with the model. The way we do it now, we kind of have to change the model itself. That may be cumbersome and may be difficult and may produce a lot of errors. But uh, that is more like in the professional sense, okay? We, we don't deal with that necessarily yet here. And then there is the final element, which was this production part, and they, they, they kind of get very simple here. If you recall, we ended up with our final set of constraints as follows, pt equals to k times nt times wt. So the only thing we need to do here now is to calculate these numbers, which we actually did in the example, was 0 0.14 something, multiplied by 20, and then multiplied by 30 or whatever. So we get these factors, which change in each period. And you will see if you look back in the book that this is you can write it like, then you can put that on the left hand side and with the zero on the right hand side, so we put the minus in front, 2.931W1 equals zero. So I take this part, move to the left hand side, put the minus in front and then enter the values for this part. And I keep on doing this until I have finished. P3 minus 2.638 W3 equals 0, P4 minus 3.810, W4 equals 0, and P5 minus uh, 3.224, W5 equals 0, and finally, this P6 minus 2.198, W6 equals 0. So these are all the six equations needed in the third constraint set. <coughs> of course, all these non-negativity constraints we actually have here in this piece, and these, all these must be positive, and we, but we don't have to include that when we enter it into Lingo. If you remember, recall the example we looked at, we didn't explicitly specify that x1 should be larger than 0 and x2 should. That is automatic in this software. So it's the exception from that we have to take care of if that happens. So now we have kind of written out the model in a format where we can put it into the software. Of course, we have to write it in then. All these equations, the objective, will have to be written in, in the correct format, with the semicolons after each of the lines. Then we can hit the target button to solve it. This is kind of a job, isn't it? And this is a fairly small model. Suppose you had 100 time periods here. That would mean 300 of these constraints to be written. Of course, you can use copy and paste. That's some sensible. But uh, it's very easy to make mistakes. So you, you immediately see the need to kind of have a general data construction of the model and a certain perhaps uh, model specification to kind of separate it so you can kind of handle this in, 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 in the general case. And as I said, this is normally in most of these software packages, they have this ability to do that. Uh, we, I think we should try to look at it when we move on to a different type of model than this one. Uh, so we can see how it works because it's, it's uh, in a sense necessary if you want to do this professionally. But let us now look at a version of this model which actually has all this information in it. Okay. If we go up one level here on front there and down on the added material, hopefully I have put up. Yeah, you see this one? Ag plan, aggregated production planning model dot LG4 is a lingo version of this model. So let's try to have a look at it. I don't know what happens if I click on it now. Do you want to open or save? Open. No, I don't have any program associated here, so I will do this differently. Perhaps maybe I can uh, just download it, save as, put it on my desktop, and open it in some kind of program. Do you have any suggestions? There's something called Notepad on Windows computers, isn't it? 
let's try that one let's see if we can find it uh, note notepad there it is okay let me open notepad and then I open this file agplan.lg4 from the desktop it should be here somewhere uh, 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 uh. why don't I see that one then any suggestions mm, file name what is happening here uh, open open scan open then I get I have to select the program from a list okay let me browse for my lingo then perhaps maybe that's good to associate lingo with this one let's try to do that then I have to go to my to computer here and go to the M disk where it is it should be there somewhere and then I go to lingo and then I associate with this executable here uh, I don't want to do this always in case other people uh, so I just do it once now hopefully it should come up here this was not very promising was it okay let's do it differently then. let's open lingo instead and find the file I don't need to say these changes to I know it's not the point and then let me open the file from the desktop this one and there it came okay now you see that the objective here is fully written out 500 times h1 plus 500 times h2 and so on and then we move to the f's thousand times each of them and then we move to the eyes we, we might have a look at the eyes you see the eyes they stop at i5 and the reason should be obvious because in i6 we know how much we should be that should be 600 that's already incorporated in the model as we have written it so we don't need to put in this this i6 we could have done it that wouldn't change the answer at all of course it would change the value of the objective but the, the solution wouldn't change because we have already specified that it should be 600 so that's that's an option we can 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 use and you see under here we have all the constraints and I tried to written write it in a way that you can see what is happening here in the first equation here this W0 was given to be 500 wasn't it no sorry 300 and that is taken care of on the right hand side apart from that they are kind of similar all the equations but only the subscript is changing 2 1 2 3 2 3 and so on you see the pattern on the on the inventory balance constraints in the first one there is a hole and in the last one there is a hole due to the fact that we had a given specified initial inventory and we should also have a given specified outgoing inventory by the end of the final period apart from that the same structure p1 minus i1 and then p2 minus i2 plus e1 i1 p3 i3 i2 and so on moves on in a similar fashion and there is semicolons uh, at the end of all statements here to secure that the program are able to read it and then the final six equations written exactly as I wrote them on the board so if I hit my target here I should probably get the solution let's try that yeah and I get the solution you see you first get some something here which indicates that these program system can do, do, do more than linear programming this is a model class in these cases linear programming it's perhaps some other p p possibilities here and, uh, in, uh, and indeed it is you get the number of variables here which is 29 number of constraints is 19 here is that correct we had 6 in each class 6 times 3 is 18 but it also interprets the objective as a constraint here. that is the reason for 19 here if you are puzzled by that so there are actually 19 equations in our model including the objective and there is something here which I can't read it says non zeros I think you don't know what that is and you don't need to care about that we will talk about it later if you like and there's something about the memory usage you see it doesn't take much time you can't actually measure it here so it runs extremely fast as I said this algorithm is a very, a very efficient one 
And here it says that the state is a global optimum, meaning that we actually have found the best of all possible solutions, and the value of the objective is here. 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, 1. It is uh, definitely smaller than the ones we looked at because they were 500 something, but there is something we have to take care of here because our objective does not include I6 here. We have to add that. So th there, is, there will be some changes when we compare these, but we will return to that next time, I think. The actual solution comes in front when we close this one. And here you have all, the, there's a fair amount of variables here. You can see that uh, H1 is zero. We do not hire in the first period, nor do we hire in the second or the third, the fourth, but we do a hire in the fifth period here, you can see. We fire immediately, but then we don't fire anymore. So it, this solution is fairly close to a relatively constant workforce solution, but we do a little bit different than we did in the one we constructed. In that case, we kind of hired up in the first period and kept. Here we do little in the first period, but do higher in the fifth period. Do a fire in the first period. Here we see the development of the, of the inventory. 20 increases down to zero, up again. So we have to build a little inventory in the, the second last period to kind of capture what's happening in the sixth period. We see our workforce, how it develops. It should be constant here in the first four period as we do not hire. We do hire and fire in the first period, we do no hiring, so it should be constant, which is this, as you can see, and then we get a change in five. Yeah, we do get the change, then we suddenly up to 737 due to the fact that we hire 464.78. So here we kind of open up for hiring fractional jobs. You see that? We hire 464.78 to three persons here, meaning that we hire 464 persons and a single person is in a, in a 78.23 percent position, okay? If you don't want that, we can always put constraints saying that our variables should be integer, integer value. If you do that, then the problem gets surprisingly much harder to solve, actually, but uh, we will return to these matters. And finally, we see the production amounts here. And we have the same structures and in the original, we have this re reduced cost which we don't need to care about and we have this dual price which tells something about what we will gain if we are able to do something with the resources and the slack which tells us which constraints are kind of binding here. So this is how we can use this system to solve actual production planning problems if we like. But remember, as I said, that um, it may be different and more efficient ways of doing this, even in this setting, when it comes to kind of handling all this data. You see, if we want to make changes on this model now, suppose we would like to look at a different demand profile. Now, if we take the original demand profile out and put in a new one, of course, we have to make changes here, don't we, in these numbers. But we'll have to do some calculations to fix this one and do some calculations to fix that one. You have to add 500 or subtract 500 here or maybe and add uh, 600 there, okay, to, to make it work. And that, that is feasible. But if we were to change this model, not to look at eight periods instead of six, then we would have to add two new equations here, two new equations there, two new equations there and so on, okay. So, so you see it's not that easy to kind of handle this model when it comes to changing it. And that is the idea with this modeling language way of doing it which is a much, much more efficient way of handling the model versus the data. Okay. Do we have any questions? The second exercise is about this model. So basically we are now in a position where we also can look at that. But I think we will do the exercise one first on Monday and then we kind of assign this one for the week after, the second, second exercise. Okay. Have you understood everything today? Not everything. Almost? Well, yeah, you can always ask me or you can watch the videos or whatever. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, the good thing, what you should do when we come to the second exercise is to look, look very closely at that one because that kind of tries to look at this to demonstrate that you understand it and try to extend a little bit to change the model a little bit. And that, that is typically what 
determines whether you have understood this or not. But um, that was, I think this is enough for today. I think I am. I, I can see that, uh, I, I can feel that I am tired and uh, I can see that you are tired as well. And we have this is our seventh lecture over this week in two days, so this is good. Now we, we have kind of finished chapter three and we, I think we are progressing very nicely <laughs> from my point of view. I don't know what you think. Maybe it's a bit too much information in too short time, but on the other hand, this is the only course you have to really concentrate on now, so you should have a lot of time to, to study yourself. Of course, what you learn from is studying yourself, not listening to me. So spend some time on looking into this, try to do things differently, write it up differently, try to experiment with the program if you are able to get it onto your computer. And if you want some special uh, treatment on the Mac, please come to my office and uh, probably bring Jonas and maybe look into it, okay? Yeah. I'll be here all, th all this week, so. Yeah, yeah, during the morning, during the afternoon, yeah. Between uh, 8.30 and 1600, I'm <laughs> fairly certain to be, be met here. Okay, then we stop the video.